T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, go for main engine start, 1, 0, and lift off of the Atlas V rocket with Cygnus and the SS John Glenn, extending the research legacy for living and working in space. Speeds and trajectory pressures look good. HR roll program has begun. Body rates look good. Good afternoon, everyone. This is our post launch news conference for the Atlas V with CRS 7. And here to talk about our launch today is Joe Montalbano, the deputy manager for the International Space Station Program at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. Good afternoon. Frank Culbertson, president of Orbital ATK Space Systems Group. And Vern Thorpe, the program manager for commercial missions from United Launch Alliance. And we'll begin first with Joel. Well, good afternoon and, and welcome back. Uh, just a fantastic launch in the control center you're sitting there, you're watching the rocket take off, and uh, just shortly after launch, the building starts to rumble a little bit, and it's just a, a great feeling to, to be back at Kennedy Space Center watching the commercial cargo launches back to the International Space Station. So from the International Space Station program, we're very happy. Um, just a, a great start. I want to thank our orbital ATK and our, and our ULA colleagues for getting us where we are today. Um, we got a vehicle you know, on its way to the International Space Station. Uh, no change in what I talked about for capture. We're still captured, uh, planning for capture at uh, shortly after 6 a.m. Eastern time, Saturday morning. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we were able to pipe up the video live to the International Space Station, so the crew was able to watch live. Um, we've also informed our, our crew in Baikonur, so they're aware. And uh, the crew on the pass down their congratulations to the teams down here and to everybody that supported the mission so far. Um, with that, again, I want to thank you. George, uh, also on, on behalf of the Space Station Program for everything you've done for us and for everything you've done for NASA, we'll miss your smiling face. We hope as you uh, move on to, to your next step, you think about us and uh, you continue to watch and, and enjoy all our successes. Um, thank you. Certainly will. Space Station is, is doing a lot for our country and, and and even a lot for the world right yes. now because of, of how well the program has gone. So thanks so much. And we'll go now to Frank Culperson, the president of the Orbital ATK Space, Space Systems Group. Frank? Thank you very much, George, and thank you all for being here. Um, we as a company would like to express our appreciation to all of our colleagues and teammates on this. Of course, NASA, the United Launch Alliance, uh, the FAA, the 45th Space Wing, and uh, those supporting us on the range, and uh, all of the uh, um, Kennedy Space Center and contractor teams that helped us get ready for, uh, for this particular mission. Um, it's uh, always a team effort to, to uh, support human spaceflight, and uh, we all enjoy working as a part of that team. Uh, but what's even better is seeing the results that come from that. Uh, we've got 3,500 kilograms of uh, very important uh, hardware on board, including about 1,000 kilograms of, uh, of experiments that are going to be conducted on the space station and uh, continue the research that's going on on there that will help us be go, go beyond low Earth orbit. Status of the spacecraft is great. Uh, everything is working well. Uh, we've got the prop system energized and pressurized. Uh, power system is up. We've deployed the solar arrays, which is everyone's big milestone early in the mission. Uh, they're all fully deployed and rotated and uh, generating power. And team is uh, in control, and, and uh, we are uh, beginning our approach to the space station. It'll take us three days. We'll arrive early Saturday morning on the R-bar, uh, begin our approach, and uh, arrive in the vicinity of the station about 10 meters away, probably between 6 and 7 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, look forward to the grapple at that point by the crew, and of course they'll have a couple of new members on board. Uh, uh, Fyodor uh, Yurchikin and, and uh, Jack Fisher will be there by then, uh, so we will uh, stay away from the station until they arrive, and, and uh, they'll be there to, uh, to help open the hatch. Again, it's a real pleasure to operate out of Kennedy Space Center and to have the whole team work together the way they have, and uh, uh, Vern, thank you very much for a great ride. 
You guys did a fantastic job, and uh, we appreciate the, uh, the the great service. And I also would like to echo what Joel said, and, and George, thank you again for all you've done. And you're, I guess we could say you're an icon or a monument which <laughs> of the space program. Uh, but uh, you've been doing this a long time and doing it well and, and uh, help, to help the American and international public understand what we're doing in space, why it's important, and uh, as I've said before, try to clear up confusion occasionally. Once or twice maybe cause it, but you know, <laughs> that happens. But again, thank you to you, all of you, and I'm happy to answer your questions going forward. All right, thank you, Frank, and we'll go now to Vern Thorpe, who's the program manager for commercial missions for United Launch Alliance. Vern. Okay, thanks, George. Um, I'm glad you could be with us today for this great launch. Uh, it's been uh, a very long day for our teams. It's been a very great day uh, for our teams, and we at ULA are thrilled to be part of this mission to the space station. Uh, congratulations again to NASA, to Orbital ATK, and to the entire mission team who supported this mission. Uh, our countdown began at about 3.51 a.m. local time this morning, so that's why it's been kind of a long day. Uh, we had a pretty smooth count, a couple of very minor issues, nothing terribly unusual came up. We were able to resolve those pretty quickly. The weather cooperated beautifully. In fact, uh, we had a, a light wind from the east, so it, it kind of gave you that enhanced audio uh, during the launch. That's the, the perfect conditions for really you know, getting uh, the sound and, and feeling the launch. Uh, we went on the first uh, attempt. You know that we had five opportunities today. We were able to get off on the first one. and. Uh, Let's see what else. Uh, so liftoff occurred at 11.11 a.m. Uh, everything performed very nominally, as far as we can tell right now. All the, the timing, the predicted timing of our events was right on the money. Uh, the orbit that we inserted the Cygnus spacecraft into was very accurate. And uh, after separation, you know, we had a, a second Centaur burn to deorbit it, and that was totally nominal. Everything happened exactly as planned, so that was, that was great. Uh, OA-7, you've heard, represents uh, the first execution of our recently announced rapid launch capability, with launch happening approximately five months after signing the contract, so we, we look forward to having more of those in the future. And uh, I know we've already talked about uh, the Cygnus module being named in honor of John Glenn for this mission, and I just want to highlight again that, that that really has a special meaning for those of us at ULA. You know, John Glenn flew on Atlas when he became the first American to orbit the Earth. And I can't tell you how thrilled we are. Uh, right now, we are working to get Atlas ready to start flying astronauts again in 2018. So that's a, a huge event for us, and hope to see you here for those launches as well. So once again, Atlas V performed beautifully, uh, marking our third successful resupply mission to the station. It's our 119th uh, consecutive success uh, for ULA since we formed in 2006. And we know that our success is due in large part to uh, the dedication of our partners and their focus on mission success. I want to give a shout out to the Air Force and the FAA for the absolutely superb support that they've provided. And thanks to all of our great suppliers and thanks again to Orbital, AT and K, Orbital ATK. I, I love working uh, with their teams and I'm hoping we can do it again sometime soon. And on a personal note, uh, George, it's been an honor working with you. You're the one who taught me how to be comfortable when I'm facing the cameras like this, something an introverted engineer like me, uh, it, it doesn't come easy for. And uh, it's been an absolute honor working with you these last few years. So I thank you. I can't remember what the first mission was we did together. It was quite it was a long one of the, time One ago. of the NASA LSP missions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. That's the right place, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm not that old. <laughs> Well, it took off from the beach just like our atlas did, so, all right, so, anyway. All right, well, with that, I guess we're ready to take some questions. Uh, please give, give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We'll start here in the front with Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Frank. Um, could you say what fresh fruit or goodies are on board for the crew, part of your Easter basket? And um, could you give a rundown on Cygnus flights coming up? Will the next one definitely be out of wallops? How are you going to play all that? Uh, actually, I don't know exactly what's in the goodie bags. Um, we, we just pack them and load them after they're given to us. Um, but we know that there's special gifts up there for the crew, and we're happy to be delivering that. Um, the next mission, uh, as far as we know, is uh, planned for September. Um, it's really kind of up to NASA when they re really need the cargo. We could be early, uh, available earlier than that, but right now, tentatively, it's scheduled for September out of Wallops on an Antares. 
All right, next, right here. Uh, Chris Gebhardt with NASA Space Flight for uh, Vern and Joel. Uh, for Joel, what's the contingency in case Soyuz can't do a rapid dock on Wednesday in terms of Cygnus and Soyuz timing? Uh, and for Vern, can you walk us through the, the small issues that cropped up in the count and how the team resolved them? Uh, for con contingency plans, if Soyuz cannot do the, the docking in six hours, they'll do the two-day rendezvous, the, so a 34-orbit rendezvous, and then Cygnus will just stand by uh, back about 1,000 kilometers and uh, basically station keep with the space station, allow the Soyuz to come in, and then once the, uh, the timing is right, we'll bring in Cygnus shortly thereafter. Okay, and the, uh, the, the two main issues uh, that we worked is one was we had uh, vis visual indication from a camera of a potential LOX leak on uh, some of our ground lines. As we looked at it more closely, we realized it was nominal. What was happening, uh, I think, was because of the light winds today, uh, it wasn't uh, blowing away the vapor, you know, the, that forms and kind of pools on the ground, so it made it look like there was more than nominal. But once we understood its relationship to the weather conditions and everything else, we, and we got better uh, camera angles on it, we realized everything was nominal. There was no issue. The second item was uh, a signal strength issue in uh, some communication that has to take place between the vehicle and the range uh, during liftoff. Um, but we have backup channels, we have multiple ways of, of having that communication. And when we took a closer look at it, tested uh, the various systems, we realized, no, we've, you know, we've got good signal strength where we need it. So we just took the time to uh, take a close look at that and make sure that there were no issues. Both of those were successfully resolved, everything was nominal, and uh, it was uh, actually a very, very smooth count. All right, we'll come down the line here. Uh, James, did you have a question? Sure. I, actually, just just following up uh, uh, Chris's question, uh, Joel James Dean Floor today. I mean, the the, the next Cygnus flight uh, we we understand September, but uh, Frank, I think previously you said it could be uh, the summer or it could be late in the year. So I just went wondering, you know, what is uh, uh, determining the, the the schedule for NASA um, as you look at your resupply for the remainder of the year? So. As you know, that different vehicles have different capabilities that support our utilization and research. So what we'll do is we'll look at all the capabilities, the capabilities that SpaceX brings you, the capabilities of when we're bringing the next crew up, and then the capabilities of when Cygnus. We lay all that out, and based on our needs, we'll pick that. But right now, we're looking at uh, around the September time frame for the Cygnus vehicle. And um, assuming Cygnus uh, arrives safely uh, this week, um, how's the station stocked for, for uh, the near term? Uh, we're doing great. Uh, prior to the Cygnus arrival, our limiting factor is probably food, and we have at least five months of food. And then the other consumables are even better. And then this vehicle is bringing a significant another month and a half or so of food on board. So we're doing extremely well in consumables. Ken? Hi, Ken Kramer, Universe Today and Northeast Astronomy Forum. Thank you. George, I want to just say thank you, probably on behalf of all of the media, you have been very wonderful as the voice of NASA. You've organized many very nice tours for us. You always answer our questions, so we would just want to thank you. Thank you. What a happy part of the job. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we saw the John Glenn, thanks to you. So that was very special to see that and, and see this launch. Thank you. So, Vern, um, you just asked my question about the supplies. I uh, would not ask you about the Pad 41. Can you give us an update on the um, uh, activities for commercial crew? You've, you've installed the tower, now you have the arm, and I understand you're checking out the arm, the crew access arm. Can you tell us about the status of getting that completely ready for the Boeing Starliner? Thanks. Yeah, I think you summarized it pretty well, Ken. Uh, We've uh, done check out of the, the hydraulic system that, uh, different hydraulic system, that uh, uh, actually controls the swing arm. And uh, I think they're done with qualification testing of that. Um, the white room itself is pretty much complete. We are making some modifications to the white room. Uh, we're gonna make some modifications that will allow us to kind of expand its capability um, so we can use it for more customers in the future. But uh, that work, I think, will be done by the end of the year. But it's pretty, pretty much ready to go. Uh, I think the, the latest big thing we did was we installed the cables for the emergency escape system, and those have been tested. You know, so they're, they're at full tension, and everything functioned the way it was supposed to. So uh, again, some, uh, some 
updates and modification work that we'll implement this year. But other than that, that crew access tower is, is ready to go to support commercial crew. Is anybody going to ride it all the way down? I think we're going to sell tickets for that. Do you want to buy one? Maybe Frank would like to do that. Uh, it's, you know, it, it'll definitely be tested. It has been tested. And yeah, we, I mean, people get to ride it when it's tested. Um, so th there have been people who have actually been on it as we've done some of the initial tests. And I've, I've heard it's a pretty fun ride. It's a requirement for George before he retires. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a roller coaster already, right? It's a, so. All right, I think we have a question over here on this side of the room. Uh, Jim Siegel, I'm with the Celebration News and Space Flight Insider. I have a question for Frank. Uh, in the briefing materials that uh, your folks were good enough to, to give to us this time, um, it, there's a statement I was a little confused about. It said, Cygnus meets NASA's high standards for human rating to permit rendezvous and berthing to the station. So I assume that doesn't mean that, that Cygnus is rated to carry humans up, up back and forth, but I wondered if you could explain what are some of those ratings that, uh, that uh, Cygnus is, is rated for or, or uh, had to pass in order to be able to do this kind of a The human trip. rating requirement basically is to make sure that we can operate safely in the vicinity of and attached to the International Space Station, meaning that it's safe for the crew to go inside, to operate in there, to be able to load and unload the cargo, um, to open and close the hatch. Anything that you would do in any module in the space station, you need to be able to do safely on the Cygnus. In order to approach the station, we had to have sufficient redundancy to be fail ops, fail safe, so that we did not endanger the station. And uh, we've satisfied all those requirements, so we basically are human rated. You're correct, we're not rated to carry crew all the way to the ground. We could carry them a little way, but you know, it wouldn't be good. Um, but no, um, uh, there are no immediate plans to, to modify Cygnus for carrying people up or down. But it's certainly very safe for people to occupy, and, and we were working very hard to be able to evolve Cygnus to where it could actually support um, um, habitats in deep space, supporting the uh, next steps NASA is planning to take in the vicinity of the moon and on, on to Mars. So it's a very evolvable spacecraft. While I've got the microphone, uh, I'd like to say one or two other things. One, um, Vern brought up a very good point. The rap rapid reaction to our request for a launch uh, is a great example of, of what commercial spaceflight can do in this new world in terms of supporting human spaceflight, excuse me, supporting programs in a very responsive way, in a different way than has been done before. And uh, as he said, we, we put this together and we're ready to fly in about four months. And that's a, that's a really amazing achievement when you look back on what it's taken in the past. And uh, I think we're on the road to a very, very flexible and, um, and, and productive time in supporting uh, both human spaceflight and, and other activities in space with the commercial industry and commercial approaches being a major, major part of that. Uh, Tori Bruno has done a terrific job of, of reorganizing ULA and putting them on the path to that. And I'd like to thank him for his personal involvement in these things and his, and his leadership. And speaking of individuals, I'd also like to thank all the people that uh, put in a lot of long hours to get this mission ready, particularly when we had to solve some problems and replan some things and do some additional testing. Um, even if it goes nominally, there's a lot of long hours that go in, but it's the individuals that pay attention to detail and make sure that we really are ready to go and that the things they are responsible for are going to work that make all the difference in, in uh, how successful we are. And, and you can see how that pays off in, in uh, a nearly nominal mission for both the rocket and the spacecraft so far. And um, it, it, it's a real tribute to both human ingenuity and American determination to maintain leadership that we're able to do these things. So uh, I want to express my appreciation, my personal appreciation to the, to the men and women who do that and, and, um, and urge all of you to thank them when you get a chance. So thank you. Question right here. Joel Keating, Fox News. Uh, George, I have a question for you. You have been this smooth, calming voice counting down and announcing the lifts offs for decades. So now you're about to retire. Um, what, for you personally, the excitement of launch day, uh, are you going to really miss and are you somewhat sad? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss it, no, no question, because you know, when I started here, I was you know, pretty much on a course you know, to do what I was really hoping to do with my career, and it's really turned out that way. So I think you know, when I look back at, at uh, the kind of things that I've been able to participate in 
in a way that that few people get to enjoy, and it's it's been so enjoyable working with with the with the people on on the missions as well as with the media. And when I think about it, it it's going to be hard not to think about it because I've pretty much been able to do all the way through my career what I've been hoping to do since since I started that back in 1979. So it's 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 been a a, a good heck of a ride. I, I couldn't do better if I'd been riding a rocket. So. <laughs> Any further questions? All right, one more here. Um, for Vern, in terms of rapid launch, with this being the first one, I know you probably can't tell us which companies, but are there any companies you're currently working with who are also interested in rapid launch contracts coming out? Yes, yes, we, we are working with uh, several of the major spacecraft manufacturers, both foreign and domestic. And uh, you know what, what rapid launch is really meant to do is it's it's to take the capabilities that we've developed over many, many years to do fast integrations. We, we've done fast integrations before. Um, I know, I mean, t 20 years ago, we were occasionally going from contract signing of a new vehicle to launch in less than six months. Rapid launch is really about taking all that experience we have and, and putting mechanisms in place so we can do that on a repeatable basis and make it more of a standard service rather than just something you can occasionally do, you know, on a, on a one-off basis. And uh, most of the uh, major spacecraft manufacturers that we've talked to are, are definitely interested in working with us to enable that capability. And it, it, it doesn't take a whole lot given that they're already designed you know, for standard interfaces like, like we offer. But uh, it does take a little bit of work up front and uh, we've definitely uh, encountered quite a bit of interest. Greg? Uh, Greg Pallone, News 13 Georgia. Just want to echo what all of us are thinking and feeling right now. Thank you very much for being a mentor to a lot of us who came into the space program uh, long after you. Um, but from one legend to another, and this question is for Frank, if you don't mind, sir. Um, well, I was actually speaking of John Glenn, but that's okay, too. Um, uh, lots of legends around here, heroes and legends. Uh, just knowing that the SS John Glenn is going to be docking with the space station, which has had people on board for, and these guys know the exact number, I know it's like 19 years, but either way, knowing that John Glenn, uh, the American space pioneer, the first to, to orbit the Earth for the United States, knowing that this cargo craft with his name, bearing his name, is going to help those astronauts on board, uh, how appropriate is it and how are you feeling right now knowing that that's about to happen? Well, I'm very pr proud that we were given permission to use John's name on this uh, spacecraft. Uh, it's a real honor for us to be able to be associated with uh, such an American hero and a pioneer in the space program who always provided a lot of great leadership both in the country and uh, in, in helping promote exploration. And uh, it uh, is, is clearly uh, a chance one more time to, to show John Glenn's name emblazoned in space. And, uh, and to honor him in a way that I think is, is appropriate, uh, given the, the courage that he exhibited in, in riding that rocket. Nothing against the Atlas, Vern. Uh, it, was a very, it, was a, it was a great ride even then. Um, but, but going into space in the primitive spacecraft they flew in and, and spending uh, three orbits up there was, uh, was truly um, uh, pathfinding and groundbreaking. And he always, I think, set a great example for Americans, American youth, American technology in, uh, in, in pushing us beyond what we have been able to do in the past. And, and I hope that, that putting his name on the space station uh, is an inspiration to the next generation to aspire to do, the, do similar things, push the boundaries. Any further questions before we wrap up? One more here in the front. Uh, Jim Siegel again from Celebration News and Space Flight Insider. I'm uh, always marveling at the different kinds of experiments and cargo that you've been able to carry up to the International Space Station. And I'm, I'm curious about whether there are other kinds of materials or experiments that haven't been taken up so far that maybe can be enabled in the future because of what you've learned um, in, in all these flights that have taken uh, taken place so far. Anything coming new that's kind of interesting and revolutionary from, from that point of view coming up? Let's see, I'm trying, you know, on, um, 
on this flight specifically, we're, we brought a lot of, in addition to the utilization and research hardware that Tara talked about the other day, almost 1,000 kilograms, we're bringing up uh, almost 1,200 kilograms of vehicle hardware. So updated uh, water processing hardware. And, and that's important because, you know, what we're trying to do on space station is use it as a test bed for exploration. So as we learn on our water processing that we're going to need when we leave low Earth orbit, we do little changes of the hardware on orbit. We fly it on space station. We test it. It's newer technology. It's the next step technology. That's what we one of the main reasons we have the space station, to use it to make our next step. So we have some new updated water processing hardware. Uh, let's see, we also have uh, a spare air conditioner going up on this. You know, that's the same, just an upgrade of what we currently have on board. We have some oxygen generation hardware, um, some new lighting for the crew members. Um, we have some, uh, this is pretty interesting. We, uh, we have a program at NASA where we use high school students to build hardware called the Hunch Program. Uh, many of you I know have heard of that. We have, they built some, um, some hardware for uh, the spacewalkers, for the EVA tools, and that's flown up on this vehicle. So uh, we consistently look for opportunities to find new and unique hardware. As for Orbital ATK, uh, on this particular program, my job is really to carry all that cool stuff up to the station. However, what we are doing internally, like ULA and other companies, is looking for ways to do it more cost-effectively and more efficiently and more safely. Um, we're doing that by looking at uh, common processes to reduce our costs and to standardize our um, activities in the factory to, to bring new materials in, uh, into play, uh, composites, uh, commercial off-the-self uh, hardware that can be flown uh, uh, less expensively um, and maybe you add a little redundancy to make sure that it really does meet standards or do the certification necessary to make sure that, that less expensive hardware can do the same job. So we're looking for ways to be a more efficient truck, if you will, uh, to carry things into space and, and to, uh, to be able to, to fly more often uh, for less money and, uh, and help perpetuate the presence on the International Space Station, which, by the way, has been continuously inhabited for about 16 and a half years. Right? Okay. You're doing good. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I think that's going to wrap, wrap us up on this uh, briefing and our coverage for the Atlas V with uh, CRS-7. And uh, we're pleased to know that uh, we are off now on a very uh, exciting mission for the next, uh, well, to mid-July uh, mid anyway. It's going to be fun to watch everything that we sent up today come off and go, go to work. So. And that will conclude our press conference and our launch coverage for CRS-7. Thank you. Thanks again, George. Thank, Thank you. George. Bye. Thank you.